representable or representative. She was a speck and specter on the margins of extremist writing. Her texts were loaded with irony and pointed at the real. Confined to the precincts of parasitical utterance, she adopted the language of a pest, plugging the kind of speech that counters while resembling hate speech. When the rules are bent and the thinking field is not level, a constitutive predicament for the girly men at the writing desk, an inscribing cry, a schreiben schrei, or krie krie, krito es krito, gets transmitted across the desert of unheeding. If you are pegged as a woman, your scream might be noted as part of an ensemble of subaltern feints, the complaint, the nagging, the picking, the chatter, the nonsense by which women's speech has been largely depreciated or historically tagged. Other quasi-linguistic worlds open up in this space, springing from the non-canonized tropes of moaning and bitching. Ach! I'll fake it till I make it. Day in, day out, I pretend make it. In the meantime, I tap out, type in, and file complaints. I reset the Klage and sharpen the Anklage, day in, day out, unable to desist from my own tightly circumscribed circle of grievance. My ongoing meckering and moaning. I catch a rumble from the philosophical bleachers. I witness in near catatonic shutdown how my sound system produces noise, the dissonant echo of lament as I stagger. Ach! Ah. I am attached to the Ach of Sprache. <laughs> this is the way Kittler pitched it to us. What does it mean to launch a complaint, something that is philosophically devalued? yet part of the repertory of critical feints. Any good Nietzschean would comprehend that at least two valences uphold the complaint. Even a bad Nietzschean must concede this point. There's good complaining and bad complaining, a noble and a decadent complaint. These can be further fissured around Freudian tracks that cover all sorts of minor scaling of the complaint as culture, behavioral grid, cult strength, medical description, cultural queasiness, the so-called discontents squatting in cultural unbehagen, or lamentable weakness and narcissistic soft spot. In our world and philosophical playbooks, the constant complainer, whimpering with no off switch, grinding down on world, can come from a place of weakness, wearing away any vitality that life has to offer, whining to exhaustion, shutting down responsiveness regardless of the push-off points from referential injury. On the other hand, following the lineage of Nietzsche's noble traitor, one could imagine the bold complainers who muster up the courage to say what wrongs are being in common and lights up the bright sense of justice who risk incivility in the name of civility, taking to the trans-feminist lookout post, the in-your-face act oppers, and those who take to the streets advocate life's capacity to power up and adjust vivaciously. These opposing stances of complaint collapse into and support each other, contaminate and cross over into the fields of their adversarial type. I refrain from saying that the constant whiner is not the most noble, even though we culturally pitch against all forms of ingratitude, no matter how dire the conditions are 
from which they siren up. This is where Nietzsche comes in strongly, for the weak may mask the strongest perspectives, covering over the most powerful dispositions, whereas the seemingly strong use props of mendacity to accomplish their takeovers. Can the complaint reinforce advocacy for righteousness in the strong, good, Nietzschean sense allotted to things? Or conversely, but not absolutely, to what extent does the milieu and mark of complaint deplete and extinguish any bump of breakthrough joy? These are Nietzschean questions that power through today according to their inherently strict subterranean logic or seismic shifts in grammar or being. So this is what powers through and yet on a yet untimely schedule, soliciting with nagging precision a time-released set of responses. Betting much of in the way of an off-track better, I was somehow put on the lookout for the furtive fate of the complaint, not a necessarily elegant mode of address or easily accommodating ethical stance, often feminized and devalued, unable to prevail when it comes to the significant philosophical showdowns. Still, I am in the field of the complaint since forever, maybe. And it is my way of running with the Heideggerian Schreiben Schrei on which I was suckled. I could argue that all of Werther pivots on the difference asserted by Goethe between complaint, Beschwerde, and lament, Klage. Was ist der Mensch, dass er klagen darf? The startup engine, I dare say, and condense of the suicide rush and ghostly undertow that haunts this work. What is the, what is personhood that it may complain, that it's allowed to complain? Ach! Ach! What is a complaint? Who has the right to complain or not to complain? even to show, shut down the other's complaint. Women and children and minorities are constantly seen to complain, maintaining a shrieky, clamorous, noisy, and so illicit relation to language, to being, the way minorities and Jews have been linked to noise in musical precincts, theoretically, and world-class fetching. The minoritized howl, all this is yet another story. Ach. Ach! I stick to the boisterous clamor of my subject, though it ever and always has to be scaled ambivalently, for complaints carry good and bad tonalities, worthy and derisory qualities in terms of their launch pad and aims. Let me move in for a close-up. A good complaint would be prepped with the energy of critique, enabling a Nietzschean genealogical scan and sense of how things have deteriorated or overreached according to what sorts of queasiness. Nietzsche, in complicity with Freud, has a sharp sense for the profit margins of destructive histories. Who are the secret beneficiaries of a certain constellation of incidents or belief clusters or traditional safeguards? What are the decoys or beards or undeclared blood sports waged in support of certain occurrences or rolled in for the prevention of beneficent, if disjunctive, life forms of growth and kinship? I tell myself that a well-aimed complaint can change the axial course of historical wrongdoing, putting in place an ethical 311 call. You should know that the city of New York has set up a number for world-class complainers, and you just have to call 
311. I do so about three times a day. <laughs> and they actually have someone who responds to you, which was a brilliant idea. The disruption of inane consensus begins its essential course by showing attunement to tradition without norm, to the way language plays you, cracking open the delusional playbooks that tend to hold sway over entire warps of attitude, or what Husserl calls Einstellung. The Bible has booked a strong inventory of social injustices and features celebrity complainers. Or not, this is a matter of ongoing dispute among biblical exegetes, such as Job. Does a contestatory stance score the same takedown capacity as a complaining one? Or Jeremiah, an uncontested complainer and the designated driver for the language of complaint? Did Christ on the cross's sense of fatal abandonment constitute a complaint? Why did you abandon me? Or was he not restricted to a quota of one complaint on the eve of crucifixion? More down to earth, the complaint turns in low ratings consistently because it comes off as ag aggressive, impolite, unhöflich, leaving victims in the quagmire of an apparatic trap on the side of the unsavory and dubious, something that overly discloses and so cannot be viewed simply as relating to what is true. I purposefully swerve from the culture of lament in order to clear the deck for the complaint. No doubt a downgrade and awkward scramble in terms of the prestige of any presentation of solemn assertion. By putting the focus on the reverberations of complaint rather than on the sonic signature of lament without opposing them, I am seeing about the possibility of updating the fate of the lament into a modern tonality and rhetorical arrangement. The lament carries some gravity, rises above itself to address an often inaccessible alterity. It has a rich and persuasive musical and poetic history to back it up and steer it forward. The complaint is of another order, something that the Bible itself tries to send through some anger management program. Dropped off to fend for itself without transcendental imprinting or ontotheological breeding, the complaint bears a tinny tiny voice, peeps up whiny and shrill, secondary in the lineup of contestatory uprisings that language has hosted, pushed to the back row of challenging syntactical maneuvers. The lament, as Werner Hamacher points out, stands a paradoxical ground, for it wants its own abolition, hoping to stamp itself out. The lament cries, I want an end to this suffering. The desired invalidation, the self-ending of itself as lament, bears down hard even when issued from the knowing stance of dilemma and self-obstruction, not being able to put an end to its case and condition. Not so much with the complaint, which seems, in terms of its downgrade and modernization, relentlessly reproducible, mechanically set to repeat its hollowed message. One might even venture to say, though such distinctions can be only wobbly and provisional, that the lament has known itself to be affined to mourning, calling out to and even from its lost object. The complaint by preliminary contrast sidesteps any ritual assertion of mourning. Resisting a fixed relation to loss, the complaint seems unable to mourn. Unable to let go, the complaint may well indicate a symptomal snag and refusal, a mourning disorder. To the extent that the complaint cannot mourn but nonetheless bemoans, 
It shares the stances and existential allowances of melancholia and sister disorders. One thinks of the grinding machines that run the language centers of chronic complainers. Hi, Mom. <clears throat> At the same time, here's the rub, melancholia aggravates and digs in, showing an end run around worldly aggravation with the statement, I cannot complain. Because the complaint is also a releasement, perhaps low on the totem pole of modalities of thinking, it responds and co-responds to the imperfect world of expropriation it touches down in the neighborhood of thinking. Any delivery of the complaint has something of a critical bite, profiling reflection, and some subtle flex of rejection, a push of intelligent naysaying. The complaint, running on empty or advocating world historical change, puts up a fight against the what is of life. It says many things, putting pressure on world, that something is wrong, or that a limit has been breached, or that the intolerable has made an appearance worth noting or saying no to, pushing back on its encroachments. Thinking and criticism are not merely interchangeable on the philosophical score sheet. Sometimes they hinder or contradict each other's velocities and contentions. In some ways, Heidegger kept thinking clear of critical incursion to the extent that polemical lunges are counted out. Still, we have to contend with the fact that a critical mind or critical thought, even critique, launched their probe on the back of the complaint, all tuned to a queasy squirm of dissatisfaction. Ach. Give me another round. Give me another round. There is something that has obsessed me, a kind of recurrent motif, a plaintive cry, put out in my other work, and that seems to be calling for attention now again. Embedded in the book on losers as provisional site of ending it all, the book I mean, you will find a sustained reflection on late puberty and the phantasm, the fantasy of maturity. Have you ever met a truly mature being in the sense that exceeds mere checkpoints of aging and the disposition that allows for stepping back, lucidly cooling one's engines? There may be some human states of exception here, but they too lapse into immaturity. Goethe, one of the historically maturest beings, according to the tabulations turned in by Nietzsche, fell hard for a teenager when hitting his 70s. But even Goethe, who transcended first chakra nationalisms, regressive familialisms, and all manner of tribal bonding needs, credited his growth to wiederholt pubertät repetitive puberty or returning pu puberty. 
The oversized writer counted on the returns of puberty to move on with creative and libidinal abundance, inviting the double edge of abandon and sovereign trespass. He abandoned himself to the returns of adolescence and adolescent exuberance. At the same time, he was the poet who pressed claims about the correlative intensities of joy and suffering. Puberty consigns the upsurging child to pits of pain smoothed over only by the tranquilizing boons of so-called adulthood. Speaking of the east-westerly divan, or divan, I have seen streams of immaturity strike even the wisest gurus who suddenly go infantile and are quoted as giggling like girls. Though it is not clear where to situate laughter on the developmental scale or when in evaluating psychic and somatic outburst, for its spiritual or purifying capacities and openness to gender reassignment, the way it functioned as a gift in Freud or in terms of rending significance left an explosive hole in Bataille and Nancy. Puberty, perhaps not philosophically mature enough to have become a full-on concept, sets up a breach, flagging a destructive passage on the road to majority. The minor hits a snag that may never entirely resolve, but is bound to return and deliver the unexpected knockout punch. With the exception of only a few, puberty comes around the bend for the second and up umpteenth time to offer faux replenishment or the bumbled bad news of your finitude, an imminent crash. Driven perhaps on the ontic level by metonymies of the sports car, the unaccountable affair, a new store of aggression and ensnaring spree of Selbstbehauptung or self-affirmation, the body bump of untimely self-assertion, ach, ah. the return of puberty undermines the flattering growth, growth and gross chart that humanity assigns to itself. As shock and disruption introduced to the concept of developmentality, puberty is linked via Lyotard's political essays to Kant's remarkable statements about immaturity. Kant sets out from the inside that one wants to remain immature. This is the desire and the wish, to remain immature, tethered to authority, kept on a short leash in an existential and political comfort zone that stalls growth and decision. In the chapter, Was war Aufklärung? What was enlightenment, the turn of the screwed? I interrogate such a moment of faltering self-assumption as the passage through puberty. I return to this passage in the quoted loser book, in order to seize on an issue that has not received sufficient airplay, or airplay, H-E-I-R, and can help us move forward if that is conceivable with the Hamlet dilemma, a hysterical knot that to this day tightens the noose around what we continue to incorporate and attach to, often unconsciously, as the so-called political body. As weighty as Hamlet has been in terms of inheritance and gateway to the staple of infrastructuring themes of modernity, the play's remarkable resilience is also due to the flaws it exposes, the way it flatlines and plays dumb, trying to prompt a traumatic truth to speak. The dumb show haunts the dramaturgy as it explores the limits of saying and showing, wondering aloud if it is capable of instigating confession and aligning with justice. One is throttled and voiceless, dependent on a ghost's directives and plaintive insistence for motive and intelligibility. Hamlet, 
who no doubt has slimmed down or was considerably photoshopped for the portrait we may carry of him, wallet or poster size, started out as a pudgy adolescent. When Lyotard moves on troubled adolescent awakening, he knowingly dwells at the limits of philosophical statement and determination, rehearsing that which may well lie beyond the scope of philosophical reach and investigations altogether. But philosophy has to be prodded if it is to start reasoning with the unreasonable. This is where Hamlet pushes Horatio on the point of what can happen in excess of philosophical dream schemes. I return to this argument in order to lift a latent strand of thought that may provide us with access to the jouissance and jubilation of the complainer who may be held back by the line of Kantian immaturity. Hamlet can be seen to join the ranks of Lyotard's Emma and Abraham to the, the degree that he too is staggered by a mode of address. This is what Lyotard says about the adolescent. There's a mode of address that just hits you and comes at you staggering you, tripping you up, that can be, sorry, that can be integrated only minimally, if at all. They have not reached the level of maturity that could reasonably field a call of the magnitude that befalls them. They are traumatically called up by a force or voice or prod, a stoos, that cannot properly be deciphered, yet produces a strong alteration, Freud's designation for the episode of puberty. So it's an episode for Freud that occurs when the turnover from childhood to majority is marked. Still, the call fatefully diverts them and something drastic happens, an uncontrollable spill of being that jostles them, relating them to the unrelatable, the jolt that they receive when picking up the untranslatable call, or the call that only ever relays to its own untranslatability, evokes the shock of puberty, the rebellious blur bleeding out of the dilemma of impaired comprehension. So this is the moment when one says, what is happening to me? I did not want to miss out on focusing a piece of Hamlet's commando reactivity, the specific way he remains enraged yet stalled, rebellious yet unable to execute a plan or hit an assigned target, girlfriend bound yet mother fixated, cute but yet to lose the baby fat, as part of the unaccountable upheaval, the social out of jointedness pertaining to a condition at once common everyone goes through this self-estrangement, more or less, and alien. What kind of freakish monstrosity just got released on the community of family, friendship, and political observers? According to Lyotard, the shock of puberty, the rattling call, affects our political narratives, even as it apparently recedes to raise havoc on unconscious channels of social behavior. If I am getting this right, the brand of hysteria ascribable to puberty cuts into the political performance and agonized concern for justice in a number of ways. Of course, a child starts very early on to complain it's not fair. But something else happens according to Lyotard that impinges more directly on po politics when the adolescent starts agonizing about justice. The excited teen running high on self-inflationary fuel and disrupted by an untranslatable address sparks the scene of action. Puberty's, sorry, puberty's Puberty's claims announce themselves each time in full revolt of what is, end quote. The runaway teen spirit, 
going nowhere fast, riveted by a sudden arousal and awakening, enters a stretch of being that remains enigmatic and active, infiltrating all manner of social practice, occupied to a considerable degree by adolescent tropes and grammars of excitability, the stoppers and starters of social responsiveness still need to be accounted for, even if we lack a grid to tabulate the saturation of the political according to adolescent excitability. Aligned with Abraham and Emma, as written up by Liotta Rickles in a certain way in his novels Alferi, and also Rebecca Comey, who's coming up next, um, Hamlet proves to be terror-riven as he tries to field a deracinating call that asks him to stand up in submissive readiness. On one level, they all share the predicament of receiving an instruction, an intrusive charge and convocation. They are commanded to respond to a call. Ready or not, they are made to assume that a call is meant for them. Hamlet understands that readiness is all. The call rips through them before they are prepared to become who they are, marking an experience of shattering decision that paradoxically makes them who they are, skipping the beat and reassuring timing of becoming. So this kind of side swipes also Deleuzean becoming. <coughs> they are riveted and invaded by a ghostly call under whose authority they freeze up. The numbed reluctance to take the call sustains the affective haze of political torpor and childish recoil. Still, there are calls, as I have tried to track elsewhere, that should not be taken and are really not meant for those overactive teenagers who presume to be born to set things right. Ach! So this is all very difficult to sort out, and my inner teenager is still giving it a try. Yet a plan, at least, has been outlined emerging from these primal and pulsating texts that exhort us to fit a practice to the endangered stance of what La Coulabat understood as rigorous hesitation, to lean into the emptiness of the voiding call another name for puberty's shakedown. According to Lyotard, Kant paved the way of a steep slope on the downside of nothingness, the id side to which I am singularly host and hostage. Ach! <laughs> P.S. The time is out of joint. The disadjustment of Hamlet's grievance, the slashes of untimeliness posed and exposed by the ghostly interlocutor say that justice is still outstanding in the sense that it is still due, undelivered. Any call for justice approaches us with the delivery systems of the phantom, latent but persistent, 
part of a patrimonial logic that shakes us awake, usually at midnight, when daytime is deoccupied and non-contemporaneity of what is serves an ethical subpoena. Derrida speaks of the visor effect of the specter that summons Hamlet, the way the ghost sees without being seen in terms of the face that he conceals, and we can add the superegoical broadcast system that this setup entails. The question that leaves us hanging is one that bears down on our political bodies, their inscriptions and orientations, still baffling and as untraceable as the categorical imperative. Whom do we take our orders from, whether these are marching orders or the ordering sense of world, under the sway of what or whom does one feel prodded, become answerable, motivated, or immobilized, deprogrammed, set for action, ideologically retrofitted, and so on. Even our most mundane political call-outs and deliberations, our temptation by the thought of action, ever problematic, crucially involves a spectro politics. Just consult Marx or any revolutionary transmitting system that deals out political analyses of note and listens to the unsaid, often accompanied by tremendous static. The complaints launched against Claudius come to a standstill, not only due to the neurotic relation to time. Who does not have a neurotic relation to time? A hysterical sense of speed up or melancholic slowdown and so forth or not? Precisely, no forth. Well, maybe Heidegger does not have a discernibly hysterical relation to time, but there is in his work no room for complaint or even for the too Jewishly flavored lament. But that is another story, and I'm headed in that direction, though my hysterical relation to time and being made me precipitate fall out of the succession and success of scholarly pacing. I apologize for being in such a hurry. And anyway, one could say that all of Heidegger is one big complaint about the oblivion of being, but still, as Levinas has observed, Dasein is never seen eating. We can add that in Heidegger, Dasein never, ever, ever, never complains that Heidegger has no admissions policy for the thought of Klage, but also because of the apparatic trap he sets for those that might take recourse to any hope of avenging themselves against him with the purpose of deauthorizing his assumption of power. The complaint that Claudius has abused power cannot fly, not only because one has to have power in order to abuse it, but also because abuse of power is the mark par excellence of sovereignty. So, among the so many released questions and effects of language, Hamlet raises the question of what it means to make things right or to presume that one was called upon to do so, how one encounters the grievance coming from above depends upon any number of strategic considerations and incalculable pulls in the direction of reparative justice. So. Can one go up against maternal jouissance? How to count down the days of regulated mourning when the reigning king asks that you get with the program, integrate back into social connectedness and viability. I will limit my stab and an answer to the subject at hand with the understanding that the text continues to pound out a number of pertinent angles on its failure to commit to the dictation of conventional forms of vengeance some more compelling than others when it comes to understanding the way justice is meted out or utterly sideswiped returned to sender. The double plaintiffs 
Hamlet and Hamlet are barred from taking action following coded protocols of revenge-seeking engagement. We get a clue of this when Prince Hamlet pulls out a pen rather than a sword, moving to the arena of writing, erasure, and deferral under ghostly dictation, noting the paternal grievance. So, as he lays dying, Hamlet's split second of sovereignty with Claudius counted out is without historical duration, yet nonetheless constitutes an event. The quiver of ascension to a vacant throne drives him to make a decision that was neither called for nor secured under law. The tremulous asc ascension, and today is ascension or assumption day, coupled with imminent decline, allows for Hamlet illegitimately to elect Fortinbras as his rightful successor. It is hard to time Hamlet's dying or render a death certificate, for he announces his demise according to different clocks of deferred finality. I am dead, Horatio. I die. I am dying. I die, winding down according to the lurching sense of timing, an intemporally spasm of expiration. The drama leaves it unclear where the complaint falls on the side of justice or evil. To the extent that it has drawn out its time and outrun the limits of a clocked action, the complaint as disposition and defined halt initiated by Hamlet the Dane appears to be in cohoots with the very wrong it criticizes. It has known only to prolong the span of an injurious misdeed. Thank you.